Um, whenever yeah. you're ready. All right, so yeah, we can start. Okay, go ahead. Hello, welcome everyone to the Michael Autism Virtual Series. And we are here with our Ask the Expert, um, mm -hmm. Rebecca Zegas, who is a BCBA and uh, an amazing uh, consultant and also works with a lot of kids and families. Um, she has her own private practice, Limitless uh, Consultants here in New Jersey. Uh, you can look her up, um, but she's here to talk, talk to us about the, the use of that, the basics of ABA in a natural setting. And she titled it, Set and Go. So I'll turn it over to you, Rebecca. Ready, set, and go. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is hanging in there and you know, making the most of this time. It's unfortunate that it looks like we don't have a very nice day out today, um, but we'll be doing things inside. Um, so before we talk about some of the different activities and skills that we're going to work on, I do wanna do a very quick overview of the principles of behavior. Um, this might be a little repeat for some of you, but it can never hurt to hear it again. Um, when we talk about behavior, the, what we mean is the way someone acts in response to his or her environment. It's anything that a person does that's observable. So this isn't necessarily a bad behavior. Um, anything and everything that we as human beings do is considered behavior. Um, it always serves some kind of function. It could be a form of communication. And it could be appropriate or inappropriate, like I said, those bad behaviors. But a lot of behavior is also very appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so what our job as ABA professionals is, and now parents, is to help teach our children functional and meaningful skills. And now more than ever, I'm assuming that spending so much more time with your child at home, you are seeing what skills they have that are independent and functional and what skills that they don't. So looking through the entire daily routine, everything you're doing from day to day, is there something that you could be teaching your child to do for themselves versus you having to do for them? Um, is it a skill that they need to do frequently, such as toothbrushing? Um, right now, washing hands is something we're doing often, and I'll show a little bit later an example of how we can teach children to wash their hands in a simple way. Um, is the skill age appropriate? So do we want to start teaching some of our older children more age appropriate activities in the home, different chores, things like that? And will it enhance your child's quality of life? And again, I think right now, we're really becoming aware of the play skills or the lack of play skills that some of our younger children have. Um, and the same for our older students with independent leisure skills that they can engage in with a significantly higher amount of downtime now than they probably have ever had. So the functional skills that we can teach fall under a variety of different topics. One is expressive communication or expressive language, and that's how your child uses their words um, or tries to express something to you. So that could be with pictures, that could be with their AAC device, that could be vocally, but that also includes using gestures, pointing and reaching. Basically, how is your child telling you something? We also wanna work on the receptive communication. What do they understand that we are saying? Imitation skills. And if you've heard me talk, you've heard me talk a whole lot about imitation. That imitation is the main way that typically developing children learn from others. We need to help our children learn how to imitate. But once they learn how to imitate, it's such a great skill for them to have in their repertoire to learn other skills simply through imitation. Social skills, we can absolutely teach. We're probably spending more time face-to-face -face with our children, perhaps more time at the dinner table, um, all at the same time. Um, so we definitely have the opportunity to work more on social skills. And again, play skills, these play and leisure skills are what we are focusing most on, with my clients at least right now, because that's what we need to do to fill so much of their time. 
some of those functional skills that we can also teach that we talked about earlier, dressing, bathing, toothbrushing, um, skills around the house. I am sure everybody could use an extra set of hands right now, cleaning, doing other chores around the house, preparing simple food dishes so the parents don't always have to be. One of my colleagues said that she is currently a, um, just the snack lady for her child. So now it's the time to start teaching her child to go herself, get chips, put them in a bowl, um, and those things so they can become more independent with them. So now we're going to look at a few different ways to incorporate all of these different things into play activities, and then we'll move on to um, daily living skills. So the materials that you need are just what you have at home. What does your child like to play with? For example, does your child like Play-Doh? Do you have Play-Doh at home? We're gonna go through some examples of how to teach these skills with Play-Doh. Legos are very simple and you can work on a lot of different skills with Legos. Coloring, art projects, glue sticks, um, all of these things, we are able to incorporate so many different skills just with the things that you have around your home. Cooking activities are great for these things as well. Um, so now we're just going to go through some examples of what you can teach in these activities that to your child will look like you're just playing. So direction following. And I've broken down these skills into some more simple skills and some more complex skills. So a simple direction you can give your child is to wait. So I'm gonna put it down. So you are putting your materials out. You say to your child, I need you to wait. Hold your hand out and give them that visual cue to wait while you get the crayons out and put their paper in front of them. So that's about 10 to 15 seconds. And then you can tell them, okay, great. Go ahead and start your coloring. Waiting is a very important skill for our children to learn. Um, so we wanna start teaching it functionally as young as we can, but in the shortest increments of time to begin with. We can also work on direction following. So give me. So if your child has the crayons in front of them and paper, you can extend your hand and say, give me a crayon. So we're teaching them to follow that direction of give me. If you have an older student or someone that has more complex language, this is a great time for us to start working on complex direction following. So if you're doing an art project, you could say, get the scissors, cut a square and glue it on the paper. And that's it. Then you're going to let them follow that multi-step direction. If you're playing with Play-Doh, you might tell them to make a ball, make a snake and make a donut. And then they can go ahead and do that. So you can break down all of these skills from very simple to much, much more complex, regardless of the materials that you have. Receptive identification. So again, this is them, our children learning to understand what we are saying. So you can receptively identify a variety of different things. So I can put all of these things out. So you see I have a crayon, I have Legos, and I have paper. And I could say, okay, we're going to color. Give me the crayon. So then you would prompt your child to pick up the crayon and give you the crayon. Okay, so now they're identifying crayon. If it's time to build with blocks, you can say, go get the blocks. And they'll go over to their pile of blocks, get their blocks, and bring them over. So following simple directions. You can also do receptive identification of colors. Okay, let's build a blue tower. Get me the blue blocks. Okay, here's one blue block and another blue block. Okay, so we can work on a variety of different receptive skills just in obtaining the materials that we need for our different projects. If this is a cooking material or a cooking activity, you can say, get the spoon get the eggs, simple things like that. For more complex receptive language, we can teach our students to follow directions 
that have multiple descriptors. So the child has to discriminate. So for example, if I have a small broken orange crayon and a large orange crayon, I can give the direction, get the big orange crayon. So now we're adding in comparison words and different descriptors. This is also a great time to work on incorporating prepositions. Go get me the block that fell behind the bucket. So many, many different parts of speech, different aspects of language we can use to incorporate into receptive identification, again, with just our play materials. Expressive identification and expressive language. This can go very simple from what is this? And you would prompt your child to say Lego or block. What color is it? This one's green. What do you do with it? Build. Versus more complex. And you can tell your child to describe this. And we would teach them to say, it's a green Lego. Um, if you are showing them a picture that they're about to draw, you could prompt them and ask the question, tell me three things about this. So you could prompt your child to say, I see green grass, this is a house, and it has two windows. So we are going to increase the language that we expect from the child based on their abilities, again, through all of these play materials. When a child has a lot of Legos out, you might ask them, what are you going to make? Tell me about it. So, oh, I'm going to make a house and it's going to have a very tall chimney um, and, and giving them the support and the prompting to add that more complex language. Imitation. So for your complex, simple imitation with crayons, I'm sorry, for your simple, not complex, you have a crayon and your child has a crayon and you say, do this and then they take their crayon and do the same. Very, very simple. More complex might be presenting them with this whole picture and you saying, go ahead, you draw the same thing. Simple actions with Play-Doh is something that we're working a lot on with some of our students now um, because it really helps with the fine motor skills and the imitation. But the complexity of this will obviously depend on the skills of the child. So for our children that are just learning how to use Play-Doh, we might just start with the snake. Ready, watch, do this. And then the child has their own piece of Play-Doh and they do the same. You might need to put your hands over and help them roll it, um, but just different activities that they can learn to imitate to make a variety of things. Then we might take this snake and I'll say, watch what I do. I'm going to make it a donut now. And we're going to turn and pinch. And now it's a donut. You try. So some simple, simple activities. Same thing with Legos. If I have a blue and a green Lego, and the child has a blue and a green Lego, I can say, watch, put blue on top. And then the child would imitate and do the same thing. Again, if this is a new skill for your child, you would have to prompt, but that would be okay. More complex things would be copying a picture from a website, copying a larger Lego figure, or using the book that comes with the Legos to make the Lego um, figurines, and imitating some cooking skills. If your child has the safety skills in the kitchen um, and the fine motor skills, to learn to crack an egg by imitating watch. You're gonna crack it here and then peel it. Learn how to flip pancakes. Again, if your child has the safety around the stove or if you are right there, teaching them that fine motor of turn and flip. So, so many things we can teach through imitation. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about so these are play, those are play activities that we talked about, things that you need to kind of set up and you'll be playing and incorporating skills. Now I wanna talk about how we can do ABA and teaching during daily routines and everyday activities. 
So we can use something called video models to help us teach a variety of things um, and skills that need to be done throughout the day. Um, we'll get back to these play skills. I'll show you them a little bit later. But right now, I want to show you an example of a video model to help teach a daily skill of hand washing. So bear with me for one second. Okay, so you will see here a video model which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a video of someone engaging in the skill that you want to teach your child. Video models have a ton of research to support their effectiveness. And the nice part about having a video model is it allows the adults or whoever is prompting or teaching the child to have their hands free and be the person that's prompting. So you don't also have to model what the child should do for washing hands. You can play the video as the child is learning to wash their hands and have them go through. So I did find a few online, but the beauty of video models is you can make them yourself. So if there's a very specific way that you want your child to wash his or her hands, you can videotape yourself doing it and then they can watch the video while they wash their hands. So here's an example of one. And you can pause at any time if you need it, if you need it to slow down a little bit. But video models are a great way to show the school for child exactly what you want them to do. Some of our students might not understand um, more complex language. So they might not understand if you say, turn the water on, turn the water off, get- um, I did my vascular surgery fellowship at Harvard at Brigham and Women's sorry, Hospital in Boston. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I went to Peru. Okay. Um, might not understand those verbalizations. So having a video to show them exactly what to do is extremely helpful. Another one that I found is folding clothes. Let me show you that one. So this one is very simple. Very, very simple video of how to fold a pair of pants. But again, it allows the parent to not have to model at the same time as prompting. You have that video that will model what you're supposed to do. And then you can prompt your child to follow that video. Something else that's very helpful for most people, especially for times um, that are unscheduled, that are a little crazy, um, is to embed some schedules into the day. So this type of schedule is a very specific schedule to complete a specific activity. So if you can't show a video and your child is able to follow a written schedule, here are some written schedules on how to wash hands, written schedules on how to brush teeth. I'm gonna come back to this one in a second. But we can also use schedules throughout the day, sort of like a checklist. So going through the items on your checklist or on your schedule that you want your child to get done before they can gain access to a more preferred activity. So for example, if your child is able to independently fold laundry or independently put away their clothes, then that could be two things that you put on their checklist or their schedule for that morning. They engage in that activity, check it off, engage in the next activity, check it off. And once they're done, they are able to gain access to a preferred item, a preferred activity, maybe a video game after or something like that. If your child has never followed schedules or checklists before, 
um, regardless of how old they are, you want to start with very short items on the checklist or very few items on the checklist. If your checklist is too long, that'll be very overwhelming. They'll look at it and see all of the things they have to do, um, you know, and possibly get frustrated from the beginning. If your child can't read, these can be pictures of the activity instead of written words. Um, something else that would be helpful, and this had come up in the last, um, the last training we did last week where a parent was saying that it was very hard for her to get her child to do his schoolwork when all he wanted to do was play video games or be on the iPad or watch movies. So I had suggested that we teach him First, you do the item or the activity that is a little bit less preferred, and in this case, it was schoolwork. And then you can have access to the preferred activity. And visuals are very helpful for everyone, but also um, you know, those with autism. So putting on a visual schedule where it says, first homework, first schoolwork, then video games. So they see you're understanding what they want to do, you're hearing what they want to do, but you are expressing that you first need to do the thing I'm asking you, and then you can do what you want to do. So just some final thoughts before we open up for questions. Um, again, so many of these skills are being taught without fancy materials. Once you get a hang of it, you'll see that no real special degrees or or crazy training is required. We're talking about some really simple things that we can embed into every day. Um, and now is the best time to really take advantage of all of this time we have in the natural environment to teach some of these skills. Um, doing these things over and over again throughout the day will help your child learn. And, and our goal right now, at least my goal for myself and my goal for our clients is to have fun, try to learn as much as you can while having fun right now for all of our sanity and our mental health. None of this should stress anyone out. Um, so if you find, wow, I am really not good at playing with Play-Doh, then don't do Play-Doh, do something else um, that you like, that your child likes to really be able to um, tolerate going through some of these activities with them. Any questions? And it looks like I might be losing power. If you lose me, um, it's because my power and my internet went out. So why don't we jump on really quickly now if anybody has questions? Uh, all right, great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is great. Mm -hmm. um, this is the beginning of uh, many sessions that we talked about doing. Um, so I will, if anybody has a question, you can certainly type it in uh, for her to see you. Um, I'm also going to set it up so that you can unmute um, yourself and be able to ask a question of Rebecca. So any questions, you have the opportunity to type it in or just unmute your line and ask the question. So uh, she, you know, she presented obviously some basics, but we are here to also encourage you to ask questions because that's the goal. Anybody with any questions that they are burning, you have the expert right here, come on, mm -hmm. uh, let's ask it. Everybody knows exactly what to do, huh? And there are some names on here that I would love to see your faces. <laughs> so, if I could see some faces, that would be great too. Uh. All right, folks, she wants to see your face, so please. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Deborah. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Sean asked a question. Um, we're having an issue with structure for many of the parents assuming the role as the teacher. Um, any advice? So what we are recommending to our parents right now is to try to devote a few 10 minute sessions throughout the day. So let your child play, do what they would do throughout the day 
and then try to schedule in 10 minutes where it's going to be a little more structured play, where you're going to then guide these skills, guide the activity, uh, and do that a few times a day. I, I honestly don't think it's realistic and I don't think it's fair to ask a parent to do a two hour session. I've seen that some schools are requiring kids to be on the computer for periods yeah. of time. We know that as professionals, I, it's very difficult to get a student to remain engaged for that long. And that's when we're building in, we're running around, taking a break on the playground. Um, so we are telling our families to ignore that and build in 10, 10 minutes. You can do 10 minutes. And it's, it's not as um, scary when you know, okay, I only have to go do this for 10 minutes. And a lot of times you'll find that you end up doing it longer mm -hmm. because you see that the child's engaging. You are having fun. It's great. Keep going. Um, but lowering those expectations and letting the parents run from there. Um, I, you know, when Sean's asking how to have parents advocate their schools regarding this, I don't know how to have you advocate for that, but I think the bigger question is, what's going to happen if they don't do it? Probably nothing. You know, it's very hard and, and there's a lot of conversation going on with schools now at the state level about, you know, you're telling people that they have to do these online courses. Not everyone has access to computers. Schools are now just trying to get them out to everyone. Not everyone has access to the internet. Um, People are, if they do have computers, it might be one computer in a household with four children and a parent who's trying to work. And I think that this is the times that we just need to stand up for ourselves and our families and do the absolute best that you can. You know, no one's going to be left back for this this year. Um, you can reach out to your districts and find alternate ways to get attendance. I know one district parents had been asking for papers and the district is refusing, saying everything has to be web-based. Well, then you have to do the best that you can. Um, you know, if caregivers aren't necessarily the parents and are older siblings, or Sean just mentioned grandparents that might not have the ability to guide that, then I think you do the best that you can. So many parents are still trying to work while doing all of this. And I think you just do the best that you can and cut yourself some slack right now. Yeah, that, that was a great commentary because I know that um, even with Nicholas at home, we are, the school is trying to touch base every day and they have these expectations. And I'm like, it's just not going to happen. It happens when we get to it. Right. You know? And I love the 10 minutes increment. I think that's more manageable. So we say, okay, you know, we do the ADLs first, activity of daily living. We'll do the exercise thing. When he is attentive, he can do it. And the goal of really, the conversation I'm having with them is, it's ultimately about maintaining skills or even gaining new skills mm -hmm. that we didn't even have to work on before. So, right. and that we're seeing that is help, helping. But I'm having to push back and say, no, we're going to do the best we can when we can. And so I think the smaller increments part of it and really making it into a season of even doing learning play and social skills. Right. I think those are still skills that are important versus just only following on academics, you know, exactly. which is, you know, it's, right. it's about life right now, you know. Right, right. And, and our children are, typical children are having a really, really hard time with academics right now. So... so how can we, sorry, my fence looks like it's about to come down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we expect so much from our, from our population? And I just, you know, I think everyone really needs to, to just sit back and we're doing the best that we can and sorry, um, and play. Like Genevieve said, you're realizing things that you never had to realize because when did we ever have this much free time? When did we ever have this much time together as a family, all under the same roof, 
for days and days and days <laughs> on end and days. Right, right, for sure. Uh, okay, Jennifer had a question here too. Sure, I think family oriented activities. Um, a lot of things that we're doing with our families are simple games. Um, you can play simple card games, simple turn taking games. Um, if your child likes puzzles, doing family puzzles together. Um, and I really think that if your child is interested in cooking or anything in the kitchen, then that's a great family activity um, because that's where you know the family can be in. Someone could be washing dishes while your child dries them and puts them away. Um, and then we're having a lot of fun. We were talking about this before we came on, but doing scavenger hunts with our families. So let's say you have a few different people in your um, families, you know, a few different adults and a few different children, you can break up into groups and do little scavenger hunts together. So, okay, here's the list of what you need to find. Dad and Johnny, you're on one team. Mom and Mark, you're on another team. Let's go see how fast we can find everything. Um, things like that, different activities that you can do. I think the exercise activities are great to do together as a family. Um, the, the exercise activities that I posted last week, there's exercise classes, there's yoga classes, um, sca not scavenger hunts, um, I can't think of the word, but um, all sorts of different physical activities. I think that that should be a huge thing that families are doing together, showing our kids that we adults too need to move during this time. <laughs> um, so I think that would be great to do together as well. Awesome. Um, Sean said, looking for alternatives to bombardment of online platforms. <sighs> yeah, I agree. It's hard though. Um, I think those things like the scavenger hunts, art projects, make your own, oh, obstacle course, that was the word I was looking for. So using the tools that I shared online as a guide for what to do, but then you don't have to do those things on the internet. You can make an obstacle course without needing to do something on an online platform. You can draw, you can do coloring activities, um, but using the internet right now, I think is our best resource to find different things to do, but then doing the things that you find without having to be online. Got it. Are there any other questions for Rebecca? She'll be back again next week. If there are particular areas of interest that you want to gain more knowledge about, I think that would be great to share it. Um, um, Jenny posted our survey link at the beginning. So please use that. That's very helpful for Rebecca also to get feedback. Um, you know, we're trying to get better every week. Um, and you know, these are tools that will be used by other parents who can log on this time of day. So I know the time is far spent. Um, we went over actually, uh, but we want to thank you again. So uh, Rebecca, we predominantly invited the teachers from Haven um, to be on board. So this way we can, um, they can leverage that and share that with other people. And of course, some of the Michael families will be watching this later. So um, once again, thank you everyone um, for joining in. We appreciate your time. And I uh, will see you next week at the same time. All right. It was so, nice to see you all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye